Welcome back to Camp David. This week's guest yacht is a relative newcomer to the performance cruiser space from the highly experienced Komar Yard, the Sea Cat 48. Komar has been an internationally known brand since 1971. The shipyard based at Fumicino shipyard west of Rome on the banks of the Tiber has produced thousands of great monohulls with a well-established reputation for quality. In 1998, when Massimiliano Gardigilli took over Comar, things started to look up for the yard and they began offering a range of custom-built monohulls alongside their production boats. As the monohull market became more and more competitive and the demand for multi-hulls grew, Massimiliano and his team decided to reorient the entire ship war yard towards a brand new brand, Sea Catamarans. So, Today, as always, we are going to review its specifications, pricing, and layout against three similar new vessels, and you may be surprised by the price and performance, given it's from Italy. Do a full tour asking, as always, what would Sylvia say? Uh, and there's a lot for her to like on this yacht. Naval gaze at an innovation and or adjustment that might make life aboard easier, as a hint, have you forgotten to close the hatch at night when it starts to rain? Have a look at the used market for three to five year old comparables. And finally, give it a Dave score and compare the result with all our previously reviewed yachts. From North America, we head over to Europe and the home of our yacht last week, the ORC-50, at the submarine base in Laurent. From there, we back out and head east across the continent and across the Med to the knee of Italy and Rome, the home of Comar on the banks of the Tiber River. From there, we head up north to the Tuscan region and the home of our wine this week. Our wine pairing for our yacht of choice this week is just up in inland from Rome in the Tuscan region. It's Tenuta di Arseno il Fauno di Arcanum Red Blend, and please forgive the pronunciation. Tenute di Arseno is an ancient Tuscan estate with a diverse portfolio of the highest quality wines across two classification levels. Three wines centered on the native Sangiovese grape in Chianti Classico collection, and three wines celebrating the estate's international varieties under the Toscana IGT designation. Oh yeah, that's beautiful. Let's go have a look at that boat. Now, looking at this yacht, it really has incredibly fine bows. That's the thing that just stands out at you. They look like knives cutting through the water. Uh, the shape is attractive uh, and also quite functional in its look. Those very strong davits on the aft end can hold a significant dinghy. Uh, looking down from the top, you can see on this one, we have some good solar panels. You could probably double those up. But overall, this is a very attractive boat. Now heading into the specifics, you can see the profile of this yacht. Uh, she doesn't have a lot of windage on her. Um, I mean, overall, quite low to the water. Uh, the uh, head sail or the upwind sail area on this at 120 square meters actually is the lowest of the four. Uh, but uh, the shape of those um, pontoons and the weight of this yacht probably make up for it. You can see uh, she's quite long and slim. Look at the, 
the slimness of each of the pontoons there and the overall um, beam of the boat is relatively narrow compared to uh, the other yachts in the group. Heading into the cabin, um, you can see she has a, a, a decent sized cabin, probably equivalent to the 482. Um, the ORC and the HH certainly um, uh, eclipse her in both beam and depth. Now, if you look at the weight, you've got 9.7 ton on this. So you've got a very light boat, admittedly uh, the lowest of the upwind sail area, but very light, incredibly narrow hull forms. Uh, look at it in comparison to both the Balance and the HH, both of which um, have a wider uh, hull forms, although the HH probably in a relative comparison when you look at the extended length has similar uh, comparable dimensions. But look at the, uh, the weight. The HH, you're looking at almost another five ton. And the balance, uh, you're looking at uh, uh, about another two ton. And this thing is only uh, 0.3 ton less than the radical ORC 50. Going down into the actual cabins, this is where you pay for it. So um, you do have quite narrow hulls, quite small cabins, uh, but they have managed to put a, uh, an athwart ship berth there on the uh, port hull in the passenger side. Um, the, you know, admittedly it, it only has maybe uh, two thirds of a side access. Uh, the master cabin, uh, again, a fore aft berth. Uh, but a very nice um, head as you will quickly see. So actually quite comparable in width to the HH balance and ORC do tend to go wider um, and that uh, is seen in some of the space available. Now let's look at the statistics. So this is where the surprise comes in. Look at the pricing. The Seacat is the lowest of all by about a hundred thousand euro, uh, which is, is, is really quite remarkable. Um, and then you're looking at the, uh, the overall draft is the lowest at 0.57 meter. Um, another um, big one then is the actual uh, Spinnaker is the largest at 125 square meter. Uh, so, a very competitive boat overall. At this point, I'd like to ask if you're enjoying the content, please hit subscribe, um, hit a like, and share this with a couple of like-minded boaters tonight. Thanks very much. Okay, moving on board, what would Sylvia say? You can see this is a, a quite a comfortable cockpit. There's nothing wrong with that. Beautifully finished uh, bimini top. Those integrated um, davits are very attractive. Uh, the shapes are a little square, uh, but overall uh, quite pleasant. Uh, you can see the cabin top there, uh, good area for solar. Like I said, they could probably double up on that without too much difficulty. Um, beautiful single spreader mast. And you can see your curved outboard dagger boards there. They're quite attractive, quite sexy looking overall. And I'm not a huge one for dagger boards, but those are pretty. The other nice thing is that rigid stainless steel cage around them for safety. Now this is a performance yacht, yet they uh, didn't forget those lovely um, dolphin seats up front. The other nice thing about this is the positioning of the anchor. It's underneath, the chain is underneath, the anchor locker right at the base of the mast, centering the weight. Uh, the Langeron, uh, very attractive there, very long nets. Look at the, the, look at the size of those trampolines. And again, your hull form, very, very obvious. You can see there again, the um, position of the anchor. Now, it does seem to have uh, a couple of different positions. You could see there it was out at the end of the Langeron, and I have seen it on one of Wiley Sharp's videos uh, in against uh, the hull near the base of the mast. So it may have two positions. Uh, good um, uh, uh, ventilation in the kitchen. You could see that uh, hatch raised up there. Now, a little bit of navel gazing. Speaking of hatches raised up, 
you know, I guess back in my 20s, I had a car that had uh, crank up windows. Uh, it also didn't have air conditioning. Um, thankfully today we've got air conditioning on the boats, but we still have the manual hatches. And now, have you ever gone to sleep and woken up with rain pelting down on you or the sound of rain and suddenly realizing you forgot to drop one of the other hatches? Why haven't we gone to electric hatches? It's not like we can't. The technology is here. You can see these rams, they're available. You can uh, throw them on with a remote control or an electric switch. You could open them all up or close them all down, just like you do your main switch for your electricity. Uh, and you could even throw on rain sensors to drop them down. None of this is complex tech or anything wild or new or out of the box. It's just not being done. And I'm not sure why the hatch manufacturers haven't created an integrated one or some of the more innovative boat manufacturers haven't built one because it's, it's not that big a stretch. Now, back to the boat. So uh, heading back, you can see this helm position. I know everybody talks about it being exposed. I don't know why when monohull sailors get on a cat, all of a sudden they're wildly concerned about exposure to the elements. They spent their entire lives on the aft end of a monohull completely exposed to the elements. And all of a sudden, become, because they're on a more comfortable catamaran, they got to have a full enclosure. Um, for the same reason they love the exposure on a monohull, I don't see any problem with this helm position on a catamaran. Well, you know my opinion of the radical ORC uh, helm position. I love it. I really like these helm positions. I mean, you can put a small bimini over them. Uh, but let's face it, you've got full handheld wireless remotes now. You can walk around and steer your vessel. Uh, staying out of the elements is not real difficult, um, but it sure is difficult to get that wind in your hair if they position the helm way inboard. So nice uh, sight lines down the starboard side here. You can see through the windows to the port uh, bow. Obviously your port and starboard sugar scoops are easily visible from this helm position. Now, one more shot at navel gazing. You saw those stern um, sugar scoops. They're long, they're lean, there's quite a length to them. And as usual, they have a drop-in ladder. Now, if you're under 40, you're gonna think I'm crazy, but I am sick and tired of the pain on my foot of narrow steps on a, on a ladder, or hauling the ladder in and out, or trying to get up on the platform, uh, dragging myself up. There's a solution, and Hansa came up with it, and others have come up with it too in a hydraulic format, and here it is. Look at their uh, drop down uh, stern on their 548 uh, five, here. Looks a lot like that sugar scoop except sideways. So imagine this turned so that it's, it's uh, the sugar scoop and the ladders at the tail end of the sugar scoop. Now, here we go. Open up the hatch. There is a staircase. Lift it up in one smooth motion. Down it goes into the water, complete with handles to take you up on and on board. There's the ladder in place with the, uh, uh, the hatch up. And finally, there's the ladder down in the water with the hatch down. I mean, can you imagine anything more comfortable to enter and exit the water on? Why isn't it being done? This isn't the only model of these. There are hydraulic versions that slide into the pontoon if you wish, but more manufacturers should be doing this. It, you know, the, the, the majority of the buyers, the majority of the people even watching this are between 45 and 65. We don't like crawling up ladders. Let's go with the beautiful water stair guys. Now back onto the boat, that lovely helm position. You got that central winch, uh, which uh, Wiley Sharp really likes, and uh, quite a, a lovely um, settee along uh, the side, actually a more a day bed, moving into the galley. The finish is beautiful. Uh, the one thing that I was a little concerned about was uh, the lack or very, very tight radius corners. 
Um, it could be rounded in a radius that's more like two inches or three inches uh, on all of these and, and look and feel a lot better. Now we'll talk about that, uh, the drawers on, on the left side of that nav station as well as the uh, wine fridge on the uh, right side. Um, but uh, you can see nicely um, finished uh, coach roof there. And let's look at this helm position for a second. Y you know me crying about um, the chairs or the stools at, a, at a, an in, inside uh, 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 nav station. Um, these guys have actually put a real marine chair there with a full tilt-up bolster so you can actually sit up and look out the windows. Uh, it's a good looking nav station with a full steering wheel. Now, to drive everybody crazy, I would say I think it's too much in a boat of 50 feet in a performance cat where you just don't have the room for it. That chair is big. Uh, that nav station is big. You could extend that settee, as we'll talk about a little later, and create a much broader sense of space by rearranging the galley. The other thing is, the, I'm, and now I'm sure that this is the owner's preference, but those countertops, although beautiful, the color doesn't do it for me, nor does the, uh, the upholstery. But the woodwork is gorgeous. Look at the stairs. Absolutely gorgeous. Let's head down. Uh, we're into the uh, port hull here. And uh, looking forward, you can see uh, the uh, daggerboard case there and the forward berth. Again, in a uh, cruising or in a performance live aboard catamaran, which is probably what this mostly would be used for or for long projects, so veritably live aboard. I don't know why they bother with a third cabin that's so tiny in the bow of one of the pontoons. Go with what Outremer have done, go with what um, a Lagoon have done, and turn it into a utility room, storage area, walk-in closet, uh, uh, a tool room, whatever. But do you really need more than two bedrooms on a yacht like this? You, you don't. It's not going to be chartered. You don't need that many people. You don't want that many people on this yacht. Uh, so you have room for two nice berths. Just go with the two nice berths in a 50-foot performance cat. You can see this one. Uh, this is the Athort ship on the uh, guest side with a nice little um, stool there for you beside it. Heading up the stairs, you've got your uh, escape hatch below them. Um, the uh, fridge storage, nice. Look at the lovely fiddles, both on the Corian and uh, on the, the wood finish. Um, the, I find that fridge there a little boxy. We'll discuss that later. Uh, as we look over to the other side, right below that screen, remember that we'll have a discussion about this. Now, speaking of screens, above this helm station is a, a full long screen and it's fantastic. Um, I, I think it would look a lot like, there it is, I think it would look tremendous and, and have an impact very similar to the big screen that Great Circles put on their Outremer. Uh, back to some navel gazing. So let's talk about layout here. Um, this is what you have right now. So keep that in mind and let's zip over to my thoughts here. So uh, if you'll remember um, the uh, nav station there, I really think that the drawers on the port side are too much, too big, unnecessary. Get rid of them, extend the settee, put a little kick out there, similar to the, uh, the HH-50, uh, creating an absolutely fabulous position where you can recline and, and look out the back doors. Uh, get rid of the wine fridge. It's too bulky there. Move the chair over, and I know you're gonna kill me, but get rid of that bulky uh, trawler-style um, nav desk chair and put in a smaller profile swing out chair similar to the Outremer 55, giving you a nav desk, but way more space in the, um, in, in the actual uh, galley area or eating area. 
and that table then can come up fold out as a full dining table or go down and be a lovely coffee table the kitchen or the galley i would rearrange i would change the jut out so it uh, goes longitudinally down the center of the boat i would slide in a uh, uh, tv that goes up and down into that and swivels around so you have nice clear tv access uh, to the settee um, Moving uh, over to the port side, remember I said under the, the TV that was over there, there was a slim cupboard. I would put a single uh, row vertical wine fridge there. Um, it would be visible to the settee where you're reclining. They look great. They add an ambiance. The backlighting in them is really cool. I think it would be perfect there. Um, and then moving out, I would switch around where the actual um, eating area is out in the cockpit. Uh, the reason being is I would extend um, the headroom on the, on the starboard side, build it up, create a day bed on top so that you have more cabin space underneath for the master cabin berth, which we'll look at in a second. Yes, you have a smaller eating area over on the port side, but again, I don't want 10 people around my table. This is a performance cat. It's not a charter cat. I want two couples max, myself and another. Uh, you can have a little stool that slides in there to complete the, the surround. The table can fold and drop down or up, and you have overall a much more usable space. Now, Heading down into the cabins, you'll remember the layout here. You've got that athwart ship on the um, passenger side or on the guest side and the fore aft on the, in the owner's suite. So this is what I would do. Because on the starboard side, we've built up that uh, day bed area and extended out. Yes, we've taken up some of the cockpit. But all of a sudden, we have a full three side access walk around owner's berth very similar to Seacats 56 design, not quite the space. Now, many would say, Dave, just go buy a 56. I'd love to, just don't quite have that budget. This allows you to do something similar, giving you that access, uh, very similar to uh, the access on the Sea Wind 1370. Um, and then you could throw the bed on, on the slide out a mechanism that I've described in earlier videos so uh, I can just turn a handle slide the, the mattress out make the head of the bed slide it back in Bob's your uncle were there but I can get in and out of this bed without ripping the clothes off it without disturbing my wife and um, it, it, it's really comfortable the other thing I do is uh, there is room uh, properly positioned for much bigger windows in the uh, the aft bulkhead there in both cabins right now there's a very tiny uh, porthole um, but you could have a, a much larger not not as large as uh, say the uh, HH or uh, even the um, ORC but significantly larger than what there is currently then again moving forward uh, on the owner's side you've got the shower there's already door in the uh, fore part of the shower to access the fore peak turn part of the fore peak into a walk-in closet uh, you solve all of your storage spaces heading over to the other side again there is no point in having a third cabin on a performance cruising catamaran uh, you're just not going to have that many people on board and if you are uh, the kids can sleep up on the day beds up outside or, or on the drop down in the uh, in the saloon. Um, take this space, put a door in it for access and turn it into the optional laundry room where you've got a fully vented a washer dryer that works, uh, a workshop, an office with a Pullman uh, berth on it any number of things but a 50-foot performance cruising cat does not have space for three bedrooms i mean the condos in vancouver that i would retire in don't have three bedrooms why would my performance cruising cat have three bedrooms get over it and just use the space so it's a lot more comfortable okay moving uh back across the saloon and down into the master cabin on this one um, you know, nice size ports there, uh, looking aft 
you can see that space right above the bed to the port side, that could be a nice big picture window. Right now, all you got is that tiny window in the aft section. Nice little chair there, but can you imagine, you take that space, you turn the mattress um, athwart ship and you, you extend out the headroom, and you've got a lovely walk around space. Lots of storage. Um, the cabinetry is beautiful. Look at the sink there with the wood surround. Uh, again, they've done a beautiful job here. I'd like to see some rounded corners on the, uh, the doorways into the shower or maybe just turn into a glass wall. That would make a lot of elegance. You can see the door into the four peak in the back. So that's the end of our tour. Um, you know, you can see the outside. She's a handsome vessel, really sleek. Uh, I can't uh, express enough the impression of the, those, those thin, thin bows. They just look like knives cutting through the water. And uh, there's an awful lot for Sylvia to like in this. Um, moving now to the used comparables or the pre-owned comparables. We've got, first up, uh, the Outremer 51. Now bear in mind, uh, a sail away using our formula of 50% on top of the base for a Seacat 48 turns out to be about a million sixty USD. I mean, a million sixty USD for an Italian beautifully finished 50 foot performance cruising catamaran. That's a deal. And from a yard that has a reputation and history of quality. There's no, there's no risk here. This is not some upstart. These guys know what they're doing. So here we are. We're looking at our Sail Away Seacat 48 at a million sixty compared to uh, a two, three year old Outremer 51 for a million. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I like the Outremer. I love the 55. The 51. Very nice, but I'd give the Sea Cat the edge on this one. I'd go for a new Sea Cat. The next one we've got is uh, sorry about this. I mean, there's there's not a lot of boats to compare to this unit other than the Outremer um, or the HH, which is you know wildly out of out of the price range. But there are no used HHs, no used balance for for eighty uh, twos. Uh, so we're uh, stuck hitting on poor Outremer fifty one and on the uh, excess here. So the excess, you're looking at a um, price there of a million fifty, almost exactly the same as a new Seacat uh, 48. Now bear in mind, uh, 21, a one-year-old excess has additional equipment on this that the owners put on. It's got the bugs worked out. You got sort of the best of both worlds. So you're getting a significantly better value per se, uh, but you, you, I think, I think the Seacat 48 for most folks, once they get cruising, is a better balance of performance and space. Finally, uh, I had to bring in the Fountain Peugeot uh, uh, 47. So this one is surprising. Um, we're looking at a Sail Away Seacat uh, 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 48 of a million sixty. And we're looking at a two-year-old Fountain Peugeot 47 at a million eighty-five. Sorry, no question there whatsoever. No competition. It's a Seacat 48. Now, we're into the Dave score. So how did this boat do? Because she's quite an enigma. Well, she did extremely well. Uh, ended up at a total score of 70 on the Dave score. Uh, that puts her uh, right with the Neil 51, uh, which has some remarkable capabilities, although the finish quality on the C48, I'd, I'd, I'd give the C48 the equipment, the performance, it'll probably outrun the, the, the Neil 51. Well, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of trade-offs there, but I think it's well positioned there. The Windaloo, brand new boat, but Love the builders, love the team there, love the boat itself. It needs the refinements of the Sea Cat, um, but uh, it's 54 feet. There's a lot of boat there, so so I think that's a fair comparison. Um, just a point behind the Du 448. Uh, you know, that's again from a Sylvia perspective. You got the flybridge, you got a few other things, and the and Dufour has done a very 
uh, the Dufour Catamarans group has done a very good job at the finish inside for a production boat, and then we go from there. But I think that's, that's fairly well positioned. Um, and if you want to put in your opinion, go to the description. There's a link to the Dave Score um, survey. You can fill it in and get your opinion logged there, and I'll be sharing that a little later. Now, once again, as we finish up here, if you've enjoyed the content here, please hit subscribe, um, hit a thumbs up, and share this out with a couple of like-minded sailors tonight. Thanks very much. Okay. Our final section here, as we're starting to get into this, is the art of the region. We've touched on the wine of the region. We've touched on the waves and the ideas, and now we're into the art of the region, finishing up our imaginary lifestyle and the cultural joys of it all. Um, I was really, really pleasantly surprised with what I found in this category. When I was on my honeymoon with my beautiful wife, we were... Uh, in the south of France and we were exploring some of the areas that uh, Van Gogh uh, explored there and I saw the the yellow uh, cafe where he that he painted it's not really yellow that was the light at night but you know what I mean and I suddenly developed this passion for Van Gogh and his heavy strokes and his deep colors really enjoyed them and what I discovered when I'm looking around the region of Rome for famous artists, it was a far more contemporary artist than we've looked at before. And his name is Nicola Simbari. And Nicola Simbari lived from 1927 to 2012. He was born in San Lucidio, uh, Calabria, um, and was raised in Rome, where his father was an architect for the Vatican. Uh, he began to develop a distinct style stemming from impressions of life, nature, and the Mediterranean. Impressions which abstractly reflect themselves in the purely vivid and passionate colors of his work. Simbari's originality and commercial appeal brought his art to exhibitions in London, New York, and by the 50s solidifying his international rep reputation. Uh, Nicola Simbari is considered by many to be Italy's most important modern artist. Using stunning colors and favoring brilliant tones, he paints with a palette knife, and you can see the, the strokes in our example here, and achieves great depth with this technique. Simbari's paintings are full of light and energy. So this one is uh, called uh, Fum Fumicino, and it's oil on canvas, and I'll uh, put the link to where you can see it, or maybe even purchase it, uh, down below in the description. But I do hope you enjoy it. I really love this piece. And with that, I will bid you adieu, and we shall see you next week. Thanks very, very much.